Good morning, everybody, and welcome and thanks for joining us for our seventh event now, Survive and Thrive series. Um, while this event is being delivered across multiple locations, I would like to acknowledge that the Hunter Business Chamber operates across the traditional lands of the Awabakal and Waramai people, and I pay our respects to their elders past, present, and future knowledge holders. And I also extend a warm welcome to any Indigenous people who are joining us online today. Well, today we are privileged to have Minerals Council of Australia CEO Tan Tanya Constable join, join us, and I will hand over shortly to Chamber President Penny Deploy, who will formally introduce Tanya. But before I do so, just like to make a few other uh, notes. Firstly, um, Amy Delore, our Policy and Public Affairs Manager, will run the Q&A session with Tanya today. So thanks again uh, to, to Amy. Um, and as always, um, we'll have an interactive that you can participate in, ladies and gentlemen, by using the chat function. And we'll pick up those comments and questions as, as we go through, if you would like to avail yourself of that um, opportunity. Also, feel free to leave your cameras on. We'll endeavour to mute everybody, and except the speakers, of course. Um, but if you are going to move around, perhaps turn the video off so that it um, limits the distraction. I'd also like to note that this session is being recorded, but the only ones that the recording will pick up is when you're actually speaking or on camera. So there's no, no other uh, concerns about um, a general lists or things being available. Before we move to the... To the the main part of today's webinar. I would also like to acknowledge that we have a sponsor for this event. And I'd like to thank um, our regular mining series event sponsor uh, before COVID uh, forced the postponement of those events, Strata Worldwide. Um, and I'd like to introduce Strata Worldwide Managing Director, Tony Lobb, who um, has um, recorded for us a few words. So we'll go to Tony's message. <laughs> My name's Tony Lobb, I'm the Managing Director of Strata Products. Strata has operations in Australia, the USA, South Africa. We also have distribution throughout Europe. Our market is predominantly underground coal and underground hard rock to a, certain, to a lesser extent. Our products are secondary roof support systems for underground coal mines. We make a refuse chamber for underground hard rock mines. They can support life for 36 hours. We have a, an electronics package which is a tracking system for tracking human beings and equipment and predominantly underground coal. However, it will work on much, much easier to install in underground hard rock. We have a communications package which will allow communication in underground coal. And we have a collision avoidance system which stops men and machinery and machinery and machinery from running into each other. It's an electromagnetic magnetic package. COVID-19, we fared pretty well. Um, we continue to employ everybody. We didn't lose a, lose anybody. There was probably a softening in the market of about 15% in Australia. USA were worse hit. They were about 30% down. And South Africa was uh, not a happy story and 60% off the pace. 50% of our people work from home. The other will come to the office and work in our manufacturing facilities. All of our manufacturing facilities didn't miss a beat. They still produced and we were very, very lucky. Our income was such that we did not attract any of the government incentives. We basically sold more than, than the cutoff point, which was a shame because we also suffered the same issues as some of the smaller businesses, probably more so than others. Um, we were probably lucky we had a bigger war chest and we were able to get through through pretty happily. Um, the government through this, I think, did a wonderful job. I mean, Australia's probably got to be one of the leading lights in, uh, in the, the, the rate of infection. Um, you know, the old ScoMo did a great job and his, his staff, his party. The interstate bickering, probably I wasn't overly impressed with. We do, we do have a lot of work in Queensland and it's really difficult for us to get to Queensland. We're seeing great pressure from the coal mines. The coal pricing seems to have dropped. We haven't seen the worst of this yet. We've sort of bowled along with, yes, our volumes have been down, but I can see great pressure on price and margin for the, for the forecoming future. So what have we learnt and what do we need to do as a business so that we're a bit more robust in the event of this happening again? We're too focused on underground coal. We need to 
continue to do that, but we need to extend our, um, our interest and our activities within the tunnelling industry and the hard rock metalliferous underground industry. Thanks, Tony, and thanks again to Strata Worldwide for their continued support, um, not only of this series, but of the mining series generally. So I'd now like to hand over to Henny, um, our president, um, to introduce the guest speaker and also say a few words, given his perspective on the local industry. Thank you, Henny. Thanks, Bob. Um, and welcome everybody and thanks to Strata Worldwide for uh, continuing to sponsor our events. Um, as President, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Tanya Constable. Tanya has been CEO of the Minerals Council of Australia since 2018 and came to that role with a strong background in resources and energy, including executive level advisory and policy roles in government and a period as CEO of the Collaborative Research Centre for Greenhouse Gas Technologies. Entities like the MCA play a key role in the public positioning of the resources sector and its ongoing operations within the constraints presented by COVID-19 clearly, clearly being the key current challenge. The ability for the sector to continue to operate uh, during the height of the COVID-19 crisis uh, didn't come by itself and um, Tanya's insights in the role the MCA played into positioning the sector for ongoing operations um, will be very valuable. In our, in our region, the resources industry is a major employer and a driver of our regional economy, economy. And I'm sure we're all vitally interested in what the future might hold during and as we come out of the pandemic. But it's also the case that the resources sector and specifically the coal mining sector despite its well publicized and recognized in most cases economic contribution, face longer term challenges to its sustainability in the face of demands for balanced land use, post mining land restoration, and of course, climate change. So advocacy for this industry and its many and varied participants in the current environment is a challenge which I'm sure engages Tanya and the team at the MCA every day. And we therefore highly value her willingness to speak with us and share some of her thoughts today. Please join me in welcoming Tanya. Hello, Henny. Hi, Tanya. So um, to get the discussion going, I'll hand over to Amy Delore, our policy manager, um, to uh, facilitate the discussion with Tanya. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Henny, sorry, and welcome, Tanya. Um, Tanya, I think if we could start by asking you about the impacts of the pandemic on the industry in Australia in general. Uh, picking up on Tony's description, he says he's fared okay so far, but not without a few um, hiccups, um, but he is worried about what's ahead. Would that story be pretty typical of the experience throughout the industry? Well, thanks, thanks very much, Amy, and it's great to be with you all today. Hello to Bob, um, and once again, thank you, Henny, for those, uh, those kind words. Um, I think the answer to your question is uh, yes. Um, the, the, the pandemic, I think, has, um, has brought the whole industry together um, as, as a group. It's been a, a difficult period. Uh, it is not, um, I think the leadership of the industry has shone through during this, this period of time. Uh, we have, you know, we got in very, very early um, at the start of the pandemic and rallied as a whole, of, whole industry to be able to make sure that nationally we kept operating. And I think the industry and, and those in the Hunter uh, region and uh, and of course members of, of the chamber should be congratulated because without the organisation that occurred uh, across the industry um, and it was led by the MCA in partnership with uh, the state chambers including the New South Wales Minerals Council uh, without that uh, we would not be in the unique position we are as an industry globally um, while others around the world have really uh, taken uh, a beating 
at, uh, you know, within the mining industry, within the oil and gas industry, uh, our country and our industry has been able to continue to operate. That doesn't mean that it hasn't been hard for the industry, that we haven't seen some uh, job losses, particularly uh, explorers and, and um, small, uh, small employers, um, and that's a, that's a terrible situation. But because the industry has stayed operating, the men and women um, in the Hunter region, for example, the 14,000 people that we have in the industry, and the 75,000 indirect jobs, if you look at the multiplier effect of, of, of five, um, that are indirectly employed by our industry in, uh, in the Hunter Valley, we've kept operating. Mm. Um, that's been very important to keep the industry operating um, in, in light of that, you know, managing COVID in the workplace to avoid a second wave if there's um, a recurrence of infection of, of this or for, for that matter, any future biological threat. It, it's going to be an issue for employers and employees across the industry. Um, what sort of measures uh, do you think will become commonplace as a result of this, this pandemic and, and will those changes be out ongoing and how do you see them affecting efficiency in production? Well, like everybody else, um, and you know, there's been many, many employers and employees that have been working from home over this period of time. You know, the last ten weeks, the, the Minerals Council of Australia, of course, have um, have been one of those groups as a secretariat. Uh, we've been working home. I've been working um, at home, and we've just come back into the workplace yesterday. So. You know, preparation for that has meant that we've gone back to fundamentals and we've made sure that our, our people are safe. Our people, our families, our communities need to be safe. We've got to have the right uh, hygiene protocols in place, the right safety protocols in place. And uh, if you're in a city, uh, if you're in the Hunter, uh, then, you know, there's still people that are going to be... Um, Sharing, uh, sharing transport, uh, public transport is still being used. What does that mean for people? So I think that we've seen a, a dramatic shift in how people are interacting. And if I go back to the start of uh, COVID-19 with the mining industry, we put in place a set of, uh, a set of protocols um, that addressed uh, health and safety issues. And that those protocols have been used nationally. They're still in place for the mining industry. And we have no intention, of, we've, we've signaled this to the federal government and to state governments. We've got no intention of lifting those protocols uh, in the short term, because we need to make sure that people are protected, that they're safe and they're healthy, and, um, and that we come out of the COVID-19 period uh, cautiously, so that if there is a, a slip and we see a second wave, and hopefully that's, that's not going to be the case, it, it, it's looking reasonable at this stage, that we're still prepared for that worst case scenario. But it will change the way we, we do business. It already has. And I think that safety, uh, which we're very good at in, in the mining industry, uh, that uh, health and safety will come first. Uh, we will see, continue to see social distancing. We'll continue to see health and, um, and safety at the forefront. Uh, at least until we see a vaccine, and I believe well beyond that. So it's going to change our practices, the way we do business. Okay, uh, Tanya, falling coal prices have been um, certainly a talk of the industry in this region for um, the last few months. What does the Minerals Council see as the outlook for coal uh, over the next 12 months and moving forward? So what have we found in the in the March period? Uh, coal prices have certainly uh, declined. We've gone from around about uh, $76 a tonne for US for thermal coal, and that's sitting at about $60 to $75 at the moment. Um, despite uh, that, we, um, because uh, of, um, you know, most of the, uh, the trade we're seeing is in the Asia Pacific region, in the Asian region, um, coal has been forecast to, um, to grow over the next uh, few years. Uh, 
uh, over this five year period, we expect to see um, a, an increase in the region. And for Australian coal specifically, thermal coal growing from about two, 210 million tonnes now in 2018-19 through to uh, around about uh, 2, um, 245 um, tonnes. So it's, it's, you know, there is a, uh, um, a, a ramp up expected over this next five year period. Um, the value of coal, of course, has declined, but we're still seeing those strong uh, volumes uh, coming through. So it, uh, the coal trade in the Asia Pacific region does suit Australia, um, and, it, uh, and we're looking closely at what it might mean for each of the regions. And there are a number of uh, projects that uh, we expect to see coming um, on, or preparation at least, being made for a number of, um, of mines in the Hunter region over that period of time. So the growth, uh, you know, this, the, the growth that is anticipated, a lot of that is probably going to come from the, the Hunter region. Uh, clearly, we've had some problems with diplomatic relations with China, which is a key trading partner. How do you see that affecting the industry moving forward and what approach do you think the government should take to that issue? So this has been a, a difficult uh, issue for the industry uh, over the last uh, few months. Um, the Australian government, they of course have responsibility for national security issues. And there's always a tension between uh, what is, um, you know, the, the responsibility and the partnerships we have with our major trading partner, which represents, you know, almost half of the exports, the considerable exports that we have uh, going into, uh, in, into the region. Um, but on the other side of that, we've got a strong alliance with the United States. Uh, I have maintained a, uh, a very good relationship with the Chinese ambassador in Australia over this time, probably one of the few people that has uh, during uh, the last few months as, um, you know, as, as public uh, rhetoric has uh, emerged that is not particularly complimentary for Australia or for China. We've seen that, uh, I think, abate over the last few weeks. I'm pleased to see that, uh, that there's less of a, um, a public conversation occurring and more behind closed doors now. Um, so we need to keep reminding everybody that China is important to Australia. There is mutual benefits for all of us to be working together. Um, they are, have been good partners. They know that we are reliable, um, affordable supplies, uh, suppliers to China. Um, and if we look at the People's Congress over the last few, you know, the last week in, uh, that has occurred in China, they have a medium-sized stimulus package that offers enormous opportunities to Australia. Uh, and coal um, sits, sits at the heart of that. Uh, it's needed, uh, as is the iron ore, for steelmaking purposes. Um, there is a strong need for infrastructure, despite there being a, uh, a declining growth in China at the moment. We'll see China re-emerge and we need to be prepared for that. So my focus has been on making sure that uh, we maintain those longer term relationships. Our companies are maintaining those longer term uh, relationships. Um, and, we, you know, we're looking to, to make sure that um, that they understand that we're there to do business, that the national, um, uh, that uh, the Australian government will consider uh, the position overall for Australia from um, not just an economic point of view, but a, a broader geopolitical point of view. But we need to get on and do business and, and look at that longer term. Uh, Tanya, I'll just go to an audience question. Um, we had uh, someone from the audience wondering what impact uh, the COVID pandemic has had on the workforce in regard to mental health, um, what challenges there have been around this and, and how, how um, the industry has had to adapt. And I guess if the uh, Minerals Council Australia has any initiatives um, to address that aspect. 
Um, Amy, this has been uh, the one of the the critical issues we've been thinking about in the in the industry. Um, there's been three areas we've focused on during this uh, this this time. The movement of our people uh, cross borders, uh, intrastate, making sure that the operations, the health and hygiene um, protocols uh, were put into place and kept in place. Second issue, um, supply arrangements. And I know that uh, many on this uh, video conference today uh, represent um, uh, the value chain for mining. Uh, and the third issue has been around um, indigenous issues. But if you think about um, what has been happening with people being isolated uh, and not being able to move, being you know ha having to do uh, incredibly different and longer shifts, being away from family, being away from community in a lot of instances, uh, that has caused enormous stress on individuals and on families. So mental health and fatigue uh, have been incredibly um, important for us to be considering, well, how do we move forward? So I have signalled this uh, with the Commonwealth from the Prime Minister down. I, I've written to the Prime Minister. I've raised it with various ministers. Uh, we're working on it within, um, you know, within industry, cooperating with industry in what do we do about this for the longer term, making sure that we've got mental health support uh, through de designing um, apps to having discussions to supporting groups like Mates in Mining, which is an independent um, organisation that is specifically there for the mining industry to work through some of these issues. This is not a few weeks or a few months. This is something that we uh, are going to need to address um, over the next the next few years, we don't want to see a single person uh, coming to harm uh, during this this period after this period, and we need to to support our industry to be able to get through and um, and and deal with the mental health issues that we that we know are there. Our industry is no different from any others in that respect. Okay, uh, just going back to the outlook for coal, I've got another audience question on uh, how growth is tracking in emerging markets and whether you're expecting to see growth uh, in countries like Vietnam for thermal coal. We do expect to see uh, growth in um, those, uh, those, the Asian region as, as a whole. Um, and so growth is tracking um, just generally throughout uh, this particular region. The strongest, of course, is coming from China. Uh, we've seen a slight, um, a, a slight softening at the moment, and we anticipate that that, uh, that will occur over the next few months. But the growth overall and um, demand uh, is, um, you know, it does look like it's going to pick up in the region uh, post this six to 12, uh, 12 month period. So, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, but from uh, what we're seeing in the region, including areas like, you know, uh, Vietnam um, and, uh, you know, other parts of the region, yes, that's going to continue. Uh, we we've on another matter, we've seen significant interest in the work pack decision here in our region um, and not just in the mining industry. We had a very well subscribed webinar on this last week. Uh, what do you see as the immediate implications in regard to the use of long term casuals in the mining industry and what advocacy is the Minerals Council of Australia doing in this space? So um, this this has been an ongoing issue um, for uh, for the industry. And, uh, you know, we don't use a lot of casual employment. Um, and I think we've seen a lot less of it uh, during this COVID-19 um, pandemic period. Uh, if we look overall at, um, at, at the numbers, and, you know, we're one of the lowest um, uh, across any of, the, any of the industries. It shouldn't, casual employment and contractor employment uh, shouldn't be confused. I think there's some definitional issues um, and perhaps 
uh, the way that we're portrayed as an industry as having a high casual workforce is in fact not uh, not true. Um, so, you know, there's work to be done around well, what is a contractor, uh, what is a, um, a, a casual employee, what is a, um, a, a labour hire um, employee. So we're seeing less and less casual um, employment and more and more moving to permanent employment. Uh, and, you know, I don't think that that trend is going to swing back the other way. Um, at all. Uh, so, you know, the industry, I, I think that um, uh, that that decision has um, has consequences for industry uh, and um, the advocacy that we have been doing, I think, over a period of time uh, has held us in good stead in um, making sure those trends are reversed. People uh, need to have the, um, the certainty around their, um, their employment. Uh, People still, there are still uh, work, parts of the workforce that want um, to have flexibility around their employment, but a large uh, proportion of the workforce do want to see more permanency and certainty, uh, you know, in their employment overall. So uh, our numbers are low. I think that uh, when my board is looking at, uh, at what... Um, you know what needs to be done in the longer term. There's a general recognition that uh, that permanent employee em employment is better for people than uh, casual employment. But casualisation should not be confused with contract employment. The two are very, very um, uh, different circumstances. And and most of our workforce, the majority of our workforce, are permanent employees now. Uh, do you expect those uh, definition issues to be um, thrashed out in the, by these task forces that the Prime Minister has proposed? Uh, yes, they uh, they certainly will be. Uh, we will have a new definition around a uh, around what is a casual employee. There's no doubt about that. We'll look at areas such as skills, um, but I think we'll very very quickly get to a stage where. Uh, business, the unions and government have worked through those important definitional issues. And I just want to remind everyone too, you know, what does our workforce look like? We, you know, we've got 242,000 permanent employ, uh, 242,000 workforce across Australia in the mining industry. And I, I, I gave some numbers on the uh, Hunter region right at the start, 14,000 um, uh, employees, 75,000 um, uh, indirect uh, employees and the coal industry is on average earning $150,000 um, per annum. That is 46% higher than any other industry. You know, it's, it's incredibly high and we want to keep it at those sorts of levels. So uh, the work that we do uh, within the, the Minerals Council of Australia uh, in partnership with others, but by the Minerals Council of Australia in representing uh, the interests of, uh, of the industry and for the Hunter region, I think is, uh, is important to make sure that we uh, maintain our employment, maintain uh, what are highly skilled, uh, highly paid jobs in the Hunter region. Uh, we've got a question on what green initiatives the Minerals Council and miners are working on um, at the moment and, and the bushfires and certainly the pandemic have brought a, a heightened focus on climate issues in Australia. The, the Minerals Council of Australia has been developing a climate action strategy that was sort of flagged late last year and I understand that's soon to be launched. Are you able to talk broadly about the approach that's been taken in developing that plan and what sort of actions we might expect to see come from it? Amy, we're about to uh, release the Climate Action Plan. I won't go into what's in it. That would be a bit of a spoiler. But uh, it's been uh, about 15, 15 months in a, um, a, a long process of consultation. Consultation with the industry. What do we want to do uh, in an action plan? So we have not made it, we won't be making just a statement. We have a long-term plan uh, that supports the Paris Agreement. Um, it will look at how we 
decarbonise as an industry. And that's not, not an easy thing to do in the mining industry. But we're not focused on everybody else's industry. We're looking at what does it mean for a mine site? What does it mean for our industry as a whole? And what can companies um, readily get access to? The tools, the information, the right sort of policies to help them decarbonise. So while we won't be making the mistake of others and saying, look, we want to, uh, you know, we here's our statement, um, go away and leave us alone. Uh, we'll be taking responsibility ourselves as an industry to uh, to decarbonise uh, over, a, over a period of time. Now, companies will do that at different rates. Some companies, uh, you know, want to be uh, very, um, quick and decarbonise as, as early as possible. And I think that's the message we want to get to, ev you know, get to everybody, that, um, that this is about, this plan will be about decarbonisation as early as we possibly can, um, um, making sure that uh, we have at heart the interests of our people, the interests of our company, but importantly, the interests of communities uh, to help facilitate that decarbonisation plan. So it, it's, it's exciting, um, it, it's modest, um, and as an industry association, it's our job to facilitate and to bring the industry together to share all of those good ideas um, and to help uh, the, the plan progress as, as quickly as it possibly can. So uh, we'll be making that statement um, as early as uh, you know, as early as the uh, the end of next week. So you can you expect to see something uh, early the week after uh, out in the public domain. So I'm very excited about it, and I'm very proud of it that our industry has um, has come together as a whole group in order to uh, uh, stage what will be a you know the the first of a series of three year work uh, work plans. Uh, starting in 2020. So we've really already started the process, but um, but we'll be committing ourselves publicly to do that. So it's the first of, of a renewed, re reinvigorated um, uh, approach to sustainability. So our climate action plan is one leg of that at this stage. Tanya, just as a, a follow-up to, uh, to in the context of where we are in this region, um, we often see that uh, in that whole question about energy, about um, carbon, uh, that it's easy for people to demonise the mining industry as a whole, which is very distressing given the contribution uh, and, and you know, significantly, oops, sorry about that, significantly the, the good corporate citizens that they are in, in the, many of the communities in which they operate. A number of them, uh, the mining companies have embarked on their own um, uh, messaging um, you know, in the media and so on to to try and get that to get that out there. Um, as a as a holistically as an industry, um, what are the sort of barriers you're seeing in that? And do, are you aware that that those campaigns that are being undertaken do resonate? And and how should we in, in the communities in which these things are operating respond to those, those, those sorts of campaigns? Well, as an industry, I'm very proud of, uh, of working for the, for the mining industry. Uh, if I think back to you know, where we were 20 years ago, where we were 10 years ago, where we are today, uh, there's been in incredible improvements and changes in attitude at a community level. Um, and by the industry itself to make make those positive uh, positive changes. Uh, yes, it's easy to demonise uh, our industry, but perhaps we've been um, you know placing ourselves in a position where uh, it's been a bit too easy to take pot shots at the industry. Uh, we've ha we really do need to um, to be leading from the front. Uh, because we are the mining industry, we need to be seen to be doing things better, uh, taking community attitudes into account and um, making sure that we're actually putting, you know, our actions are visible. We have been our worst, uh, our own worst enemy in we don't sing our own praises. We haven't been, um, uh, you know, demonstrating beyond just the local communities 
just how important the, the minerals industry is for every, um, you know, to e everyday use. Uh, so that's why in the last couple of years, you've seen uh, the, the MCA take uh, our industry positioning campaign, there's more to Australian mining, to demonstrate exactly what we've been doing out there um, every day. Our, our mobile phones um, use massive amount of minerals. The coal that we produce uh, in the Hunter Valley is used for infrastructure all over the world, you know, to, to create the tallest buildings and the bridges. So it's telling that story better. And, and we've, I really think that we've started to see that cultural change towards um, uh, demonstrating how we have been responsible and, um, and why we will continue to be responsible and important for as, a, as an industry uh, for people everywhere in the world. Uh, everything we use um, is, uh, is certainly, uh, you know, comes, it, you either, I have a saying, you either mine it or you eat it. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're going to use something, uh, a phone, a laptop, you know, all of the technology we're using today comes from the mining industry. And we have to celebrate that. Thank you. Uh, Tanya, we've probably got time for, for one more audience question. I've got one here about uh, how you see the opportunities in the rare earths um, se sector and whether we should be advocating to process these minerals locally to add to the push for manufacturing in line with the sovereign risk we're often hearing about from, from government at the moment. So this has been an area that uh, that has uh, you know it, it's it's important uh, for countries to have a certain amount of um, of uh, um, self uh, um, uh, reliance on uh, on minerals um, and on uh, you know on commodities. We've seen that around the world. Australia is no different to that. Uh, China, you know, some of our, our, um, our minerals are concentrated in some countries around the world. Uh, China has had a, you know, most of our um, rare earths that we produce in Australia uh, go to China for manufacturing purposes. Now that has created, I think, a concern for other countries. It's created a concern for Australia, for the United States, for some in the EU that, uh, see that concentration as um, as a potential problem for their own manufacturing uh, purposes. So there has been a need to diversify the interests um, and the mining um, and supply of some of our minerals, including rare earths. So uh, that is something that has presented an opportunity for Australia. So once again, we've looked at the value chain about where is it economic to produce uh, in Australia and value add in Australia. I won't say that all of uh, the, the different minerals are going to be economic for us to produce uh, further down the value chain uh, to you know, value add in the, um, in the value chain. But there are some industries, for example, lithium uh, is one of those where it is um, a potential area for us to value add in Australia and do some downstream processing. I'm really pleased to see that uh, a, cri a critical minerals facilitation office has been set up at a government level to help facilitate and act as a conduit uh, with some other countries, the United States, Canada, the EU, for us to look at how we might um, uh, do some of that value adding uh, in Australia. And we've seen some, I think, some good news stories start to emerge. One of our members, uh, Linus, um, is, uh, has certainly been doing very well and has um, just uh, received a defence uh, contract in the United States. So, um, uh, but Australia is an expensive place to produce. Our labour costs are the reason why that is the case. I said, mm. we've got very high wages. We can't do anything about that. We want to maintain those high wages. So we have to uh, find ways to be innovative uh, in the way that we produce our materials um, and value add to our materials for that to be viable uh, in uh, uh, further downstream. Um, 
we got as a final question, Tanya, um, and uh, the, the, you, you probably referred to it in that answer. But one of the questions here was about how we, we've seen across the world that the pivoting that many industries have been doing in response to the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, Mining is a very big ship and one that probably turns slowly. But I'm just curious: is there other things that you see that might be an innovation that might come as a consequence of some of this? mind shift that we are seeing around the world, um, you know, be, be it in the, the behavioural aspects that you've already referred to, or um, innovation in, in mining practices and, and, and output um, as a consequence of a need to adjust to um, different pulses from the world. Well, we shouldn't lose sight of the, the point, uh, Bob, that mining is already an advanced manufacturing sector. And again, that's still not well known, um, even within Australia, just how advanced and how leading edge we are and how innovative we have to be, uh, not least of all because a lot of, our, um, a lot of our industry is in remote areas and you've got to be innovative when you're actually living and working in remote areas. Um, so that has led to, I think, uh, us um, thinking about what, opportunities we might take uh, from this COVID-19 um, phase, how we might uh, get ahead and be not just a great industry, but supercharge our industry for the future. The MET sector, um, the mining engineering technology service se sector, has come through very strongly um, over the last few years and there's real opportunities for our industry um, further downstream in uh, you know, taking that next um, you know, that next level uh, of um, innovation that they've been working, working on um, to, uh, to the rest of, rest of the world. But I think there's some, some areas that have presented other opportunities in Australia that, um, that have come directly as of, you know, as a result of COVID-19. We've drawn a lot of our supplies from areas where manufacturing has been cheaper. Uh, for example, in um, health and hygiene, uh, there's been a real shortage of uh, some products, not least of all masks for our industry uh, and for the health industry in Australia and for, you know, for people generally when um, they've wanted to use them. Uh, the specifications that we've required um, has meant that, uh, that uh, that our masks can be used for the health industry. Health industry masks can't be used for our, for our industry. So there's been a really big shortage around, um, uh, around Australia and you know, for the rest of the world. But we've seen new opportunities created in Australia where uh, some, um, you know, some companies have, have looked at what the needs are um, what government announcements might be coming through, for example, um, you know, the, the issue about self-reliance uh, in the longer term in some areas and health will be one of them. And I think the companies are responding uh, and the mining industry is now partnering with some of those companies to look at what the long-term supply arrangements might be, for example, on masks. And there's a great South Australian story that I like to tell uh, with, a, with a company over there that has changed the way that they've been doing business um, to create what will be the next, um, you know, the, the type of mask that we need in the industry at a globally competitive price. So, you know, we're starting to produce and starting to manufacture again in Australia. And it's those sorts of examples that I think we're starting to see uh, elsewhere. Um, the other opportunity that I just want to raise is that uh, we've all moved beyond single industries now. Um, the mining industry uh, is partnering with other industries, for example, construction, manufacturing, defence, on how we might build our skill sets again. Um, and the training that we will do um, the, the skills that we need for, the, for employment for the longer term within uh, the mining industry are also skill sets. If you think about areas like data analytics or some of the softer skills around teamwork, change management, those sorts of things are not unique to the mining industry. 
So it presents us an opportunity to work with other industries and, uh, and build those skill sets. So where we're, where we're seeing um, areas of, of downturn occurring, that our people are well enough trained, um, have the right sort of skills that are transferable, not just um, uh, you know, for the use in the mining sector, but use in other sectors uh, as, we're, as we're moving through the, you know, the next few years. And that's, again, an exciting opportunity and one we're building on in the MCA. Yes, uh, thank you. And you, uh, you've hit that, that is a very important subject and one that you know, maybe we'll get the opportunity to actually get you back here in Newcastle when we, when we can in person because that whole skills thing is very important to this region and right around Australia, especially when you consider youth unemployment levels at the moment. And hopefully, the, you know, in the job maker conversations that the government's about to have, that's, you know, some of those aspects will take front and centre so that we can, we can get that sorted. So, but Tanya, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, and uh, we really do appreciate it. And I, I can hear the virtual applause from around the, around the audience as I speak. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for taking time out of your busy diary to be with us. Um, and uh, as I said, I, I hope we get the opportunity in the future to invite you to Newcastle uh, in person and, uh, and, and talk to more. Well, it's been a great pleasure, Bob. Thank you very much uh, to you and Henny and, and Amy and for all the participants today. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to you all. And yes, I would love to accept your invitation to Newcastle. I look forward to seeing you, not virtually, but in, uh, in person, face to face in the, uh, in the near future. So good Thank luck you. and and I hope that uh, you're all staying well in the Hunter region. Yes, we're doing our best and uh, as, as, as you acknowledged and as, as, uh, as Annie Lobb said, you know, it's in different fashion, but we're, we're, we're coping. So thanks, thanks again. Just before I close, ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to remind you um, of, our, of our final event in our Survive and Thrive series, which is a regional leaders panel on 10th of June at 2 p.m. Uh, and the, our contributors on that occasion will be Dr. Peter Cox, the CEO of Newcastle Airport, Bernadette Inglis, the CEO of Newcastle Permanent, and Henny Deploy, CEO of Port Waratah Coal Services, and of course, President of the Hunter Business Chamber. So hopefully you can join us for some valuable insights on, uh, on what the region can do next and, and what our experience in the immediate past has also been. Um, finally, thanks again to Strata Worldwide for their sponsorship today. Thanks, Henny, for your uh, participation and again to Amy and also Jack from Oasis Media for helping coordinate things. Um, and thanks again to Tanya and your team for, for being part of uh, and cooperating with us to get this up and going today. And um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for participating. And I hope to see you at our next webinar event in the near future. Thank you.